Can everyone hear me now? I know. That'll get it. Nice. All right. So today we are very lucky to have uh, Arlene Cardu. Cardu. Sorry. Uh, volunteer at the Benson House that's down in Grant, Florida. Uh, she's going to talk to us about the history of the city of Grant uh, and its surrounding towns. So without further ado, I'm going to have Arlene take us for a tour. And, and I did. Thank you. Okay. I, I'm just curious, um, how many people are Floridians born and raised here? Oh, there's a few people here. Okay. All the rest of you are from somewhere else? Massachusetts. Three months old, I moved to Grant. Three what? Three months old, I moved to Grant. Oh, wow, okay. Other places, other states? Connecticut. Connecticut. New Jersey. New Jersey. Seattle. Seattle, Washington? Yes, sir. Come on. West Virginia. West Virginia. Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania. New Hampshire. New Hampshire. Wisconsin. Wisconsin. Yeah, we had people coming from Wisconsin. Okay. Well, I was born in Grant. You were born in Grant. Okay. <laughs> Double people born in Grant. Oh, the Macalonis. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Well, um, we have a. I know uh, St. Augustine is your oldest city, <clears throat> it's the oldest city in the country, um, it's in Florida, and um, I guess the history is, it started out with Christopher Columbus, and I'll do some pictures as we talk, and you're welcome to come up and view these after. Christopher Columbus sailed the ocean blue in 1492, we all learned that in school, right? Rock. Four trips. And I think it was Ponce de Leon came to, or came to the um, Caribbean islands and Puerto Rico and Hispaniola on Christopher Columbus' second voyage. Are we okay? Yeah. So we have this map that kind of points out um, the different stops along the way, the storms that they might have had. Um, and when they got to Florida, Ponce de Leon, we met the Indians. And I was traveling with Leslie Coure through driving home to um, Massachusetts and New Hampshire. And we stopped at a town in North Carolina that had an Indian um, store and found this wonderful poster. And I guess the important part for Florida is we had several tribes, and in particular, the ones from the coast of Jupiter were the Eyes Indians, um, not the friendliest group of Indians. Um, with the European in, um, settlements in the country, we brought them the European diseases, so we really devastated a lot of the Indian pop population um, in this North American country. So after we um, destroyed our Indian population, we became activists in wanting to move west and secure all the land for ourselves. And when I think of Florida, because I'm not from Florida, this is what I think the early settlers had to deal with. If you homesteaded, what you promised to do was, for five acres of land or whatever the size was, was to um, build a home, clear the land, and make it profitable. So in Florida, the story on this particular picture is, this is a World War II watchtower that women used to command. And what they were basically assigned to do was look for suspicious planes flying or people on the river. And then binoculars and um, telephone call, phone calls to Patrick Air Force Base would alert the army that something was going on in the area and was it friend or foe. So to me, when the Bensons arrived, when the Christiansons arrived, when our early pioneers arrived, they had this wonderful tropical environment to um, take care of and manage. And I guess you had a boat and a river. 
We have garages and cars now, but that's how those people got around. And you either grew it or um, harvest it from the ocean and or caught it, turtle soup, I guess, deer and whatnot like that. While Florida was flourishing, um, we elected a president, Abraham Lincoln, and his purpose was to kind of resolve the growth and spread of slavery. And we know that Florida was one of the states that seceded from the <coughs> Union, and it was how to protect your investment, your farm, and your wealth. So we have a picture of that, and we have Abraham Lincoln in the Civil War, which was thought to be a short battle, but not for what, four or five years before it ended. Before we had the Civil War, the American Revolution occurred because the 13 original colonies decided that they wanted their own independence. They didn't like the taxation. They didn't like um, being governed from afar. Now, those of us from New England, Plymouth Rock, 1620, a little picture of what the northern people settled on versus you people in Florida. Same issues, housing, food, diseases brought to the Indians. Um, Grant was probably established, I'm going to say in the late 1880, and the families that arrived in our area where we know Edwin Nelson was the postmaster. We know that um, Lars Jorgensen came from Wisconsin. We know that the Bensons came from, um, not Michigan, I don't think. Oh, no. Gail, can you give me, a, my brain is absent. The Bensons came from Wisconsin. Was, oh, Elk Mountain, Wisconsin. See my little historian. Um, these families came from Europe, settled somewhere else in the United States, and then heard through maybe Danish newspapers that Florida was a wealthy place to come and work because you had the abundance of the river. Um, it was a better climate. I know the Bensons were from Denmark, and the reason they came south was because the winter for the farming in Wisconsin was more, I guess, devastating, colder, not um, pleasant for them to farm in. So they came and settled in the Grant area. Um, with them, they came with three boys, and we have pictures of them up here that you can look at. Fishing was the industry for coastal Florida, probably all the Atlantic coast, or anywhere from north of Grant and south of Grant. And the fishing industry allowed them to prosper. And um, as we evolved as a country, um, people started out with, you lived in that desolate area. We ended up with electricity, which came to Grant in the 1940s. Um, the couch manufacturing company probably was the biggest industry in town. And with their um, electricity and their phone, the community was able to um, engage in necessary phone calls or pipe up um, electricity into um, other homes. So couch manufacturing was in the center of Florida. We have a map. Has is anyone acquainted with Grant? We have a few people. Okay. This is the map from 1974 taken by Homa Cato. We see the Indian River. We see what is um, Grant Farm. We see the barrier islands or the land to um, the Atlantic Ocean. Grant Farm was a place for pineapple. Um, plantation. Um, the Spanish people brought horses, orange, um, orange trees, cattle. So they had the opportunity over the over the evolving years to go from a town of maybe five or ten people to a thriving little community. So in 1974, we have pictures of what early Grant is. We have um, the Grant Grocery Store, which was built by Louis Benson in 1894. Is it 
I'll hold it up for you and you can point. Oh, okay. Grant, our thriving city of what, 300 people maybe, a little bit more. Um, the Grant Grocery Store, built in 1894 by um, Lewis Benson, had our first post office in that particular facility on the first floor in the south section. It's now a restaurant. It's um, Rib City. Has anybody eaten there recently? If you go in, yep, it's a um, big rib restaurant. They tried to restore the original post office setting, so you have a um, mural on the wall with Mr. Um, Lewis Benson and his mailboxes, and you can see a mailbox wall. You can see where you paid for your stamps, and um, you can have some, the waitress will very gladly take your picture, but you can go up to it and pretend you're leaning on the counter, and it'll look like you were there at the post office with the Benson. Okay, across from Rib City, um, our first brick and mortar post office was built in um, 19, 1959, opened up. And now um, we have another one further down the road. It became Tony's Fish Market, so that's a, a landmark area. And our president, uh, Ruby Lord, her house made the picture. That's over here. Um, if you come up First Street, we have what is known as the Community Center, the Grant Community Center, home of the Grant Seafood Festival. And last year it celebrated its 50th anniversary. Um, Grant merged or incorporated with Valkyria in 2006. So last year we had a similar celebration for Grant Valkyria. And then there was one other event going on. It escapes me right now. But the community center would have been, after the one-room schoolhouse built in 1892, it was a brick and mortar. It, we have our library there now, it was the fire department there, and now it's part of the Grand Seafood Festival, which takes over all of this neighborhood. Coming further down or up um, First Street, we would have had the Ridgeland Hotel, built by Lars Jorgensen. He came to this country with um, five kids, and because of his arrival, they had to build the one-room schoolhouse in 1892. So the Ridgeland Hotel was taken probably around World War II era because they needed wood, so we'll just take in your dwelling. Um, the community center is in here, and one of the activities was baseball. And then uh, another early settler, is um, Peter Christensen, and he donated a half acre of land, which became our cemetery. And that's further up First Street and, and on the corner of Bre um, Brabrook um, over here. Um, the, we presume that the home built by um, Atlee and Clara Benson is this driveway over here and possibly where this bigger dwelling is, is where the sister, um, Lily Christensen and Adolf ba um, ba Benson would have lived. And when the Benson family um, died, the mother died in 1981, the father died in 1961, the middle child, Russell, um, donated the house with the stipulation that we had to move it and it was it's now part of um, Fisherman's Landing. So they have to go through all the permitting, all the site planning. Um, paid about $47,000 to get the house finally moved, restored, and opened to the public as a museum in 1987. And that was, it was moved from this general location on the river to Fisherman's Landing, which I think is a little bit further south here. Is your arm tired now? Would you like to have a break? <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, with the move, um, as probably other museums are doing, the struggle was to get it up and running, um, have funds to do the restoration, and then open to the public. So here is our home right now. It's on the Indian River. It's not in the same position as the original house, 
I can find it. Let's see it right now. Um, we have to uh, we have to we have to turn it. Has a dock on it. Hurricane uh, Matthew last October peeled part of our roof off, so we're looking at estimates now to do some roof restoration. The Grant Railroad Station, which was built in 1894, we think, um, was also moved to the site. Now, when the railroad station was taken off or on a commission, I guess, like a ship, it was brought to the Department of Transportation lot on Valkyria Road and then brought back to also Fisherman's Landing. And that project was um, started as a restoration, but we had the death of uh, Margaret Senny, the um, president of our, community, our historical society and a big at, um, activist for the Grand Seafood Festival. So documentation that I found shows that they applied for grant money, but we didn't have proof of deed of ownership. And then with the deaths, kind of things have um, slowed down. Part of the other growth in our uh, community is in 1958, um, Florida FIT, which was originally called an engineering school, provide engineering school, um, was built and participated in our rocket program. And in the 50s, we had the space program come in, and we were fortunate to have uh, the textbook on the history of FIT, the launch at Cape Canaveral, and all the um, badges that um, the launches um, that were not at Cape Canaveral. And so my backyard is on the Carrier Road. I don't see the ground level, but I can actually see the rockets going up after their launch. So that's a pretty nice thing. Okay, uh, let's see. Clara, let's talk about the, the woman who started it all with her husband. Clara was um, a Christian sin. Basically, dad came, I think, from Michigan, not sure if it was Michigan, Wisconsin, someplace, was connected with the railroad. And he took a similar job here. He had two sons, um, Charles Samuel and Christian Christensen. The family still lives within the community. And when you're in Grant and you're going to talk about something you see or didn't like, be careful who you talk to because Grant's related to each other. <laughs> Too many Christiansons, Bensons, um, Jorgensons, whatnot. So we have the family here. Clara was educated at the Grant One Room Schoolhouse. And we have her, um, they did nice things like this, yes, back then. April 27, 1900, the teachers gave students a little remembrance book. And we happened to have hers. And the names in town at 1900 was Terry Jorgensen, Louise Smith, Barbara, is that your family? No, not different. Okay. Clara Christensen, so Clara and um, Lily, our sisters. Edmund Fredericks, I don't know much about the Fredrick family. Uh, Myrtle Nelson, I'm going to presume, was maybe the first postmaster, and his business was operated out of a police. So you went to his home, his front porch, or whatever, and bought stamps or postcards. Um, Stella Nelson, I think that might be a, ch a child of the postmaster, Lily Christensen, Freddie Stiller, and Johnny Jorgensen. And the youngest Jorgensen child when they came to Grant was like six months old. So we, we have them. Clara, uh, after her um, education at the elementary school, went on to be educated in Brevard County and was a school teacher at the One Room Schoolhouse. So this is a very interesting little product. This is the booklet she gave to her students. And they list um, the students, and this is 19, 1914, Clara would have been about 22, Laura Smith. John's mother. That's my mother. John's mother, okay. Willie Pence. I tried to do research on him and didn't find anything, so I don't know Mr. Pence. Ruth Jones, 
not anybody I knew, Templin, Josephine Templin, Charner Smith, my uncle. uncle. So son of R.T. Smith. Smith, who um, settled here with his brother on Mullet Creek and grew beans and other vegetables, pineapples, and fishing, started a fishing camp. My father. That would be your father, Barbara, right? Okay, so I, I guess it was um, Charles that got tired of the farming thing, so he bought. Well, granddaddy bought him out because he got married. Oh, he got married. And oh, no, Charlie. <laughs> <laughs> Charlie was brought up because he got married. Okay. My grandfather got married. Your grandfather got married. Okay. So China Smith, Ida Smith, aunt, aunt, John Smith, father, father, and Lucy Maxwell. Not sure about the Maxwells, but um, Smiths had eight <coughs> children. Yes. Eight children, and I guess back then. To survive and manage your estate, property, home, farm, fishing businesses, you have a lot of kids. And that's how you survive. Okay, so Clara's a teacher. She's a traveling teacher. And she, she went to, I don't know, I think in Florida you call them ghost towns. They're towns that no longer exist. And because of the space program, Allenhurst is one of those ghost towns. And she also taught at Canaveral. Now she she and her sister Lily married two brothers, and they were neighbors. And uh, in fact, they were side by side neighbors. And when the family got together, the big event was put all the picnic tables between the whole two homes and celebrate from there. Lily had nine children. One one died from a kidney ailment, uh, probably at age three. The Bensons had three boys, which engaged in the fishing business. John is was the bookkeeper, I understand, and um, Atlee and Adolph actually did the business. So we'll meet this family. They probably arrived. They built the Grant Grocery Store in 1894, so they had to get here also probably in the late 1800s. So we have Mom. Can I ask you to pull that for Mom died probably around 1900 um, and left her husband without kids. And we have Atlee, who married Clara. We have Adolph, who married Lily. We have John, who was the, I think, the oldest brother. And Lizzie, the second born, um, lived in Fort Pierce. And their child, um, um, Loretta. Um, this is Mr. Benson, and you'll see his picture. That's his face you'll see in the Grand Grocery Store as the postmaster. Here they are after they built their home, which is the Benson house. It was a yellow pine pre cut home, and it was shipped to the land or the site in 1916. They put it together, and um, Clara and Atlee Benson got married December 30th, 1916. They raised three boys, and then we have, so we have Russell Atlee Jr. and Edward Hartman. It's the middle child that donated the property, or the home, actually, <coughs> to the community center and the Grand Historical Society with the stipulation that they were gonna, you didn't have to move it up away. So that was struck down thanks to the middle son who thought to give it in remembrance of his mom for our existing museum. Early settlers had the advantage of going to the supermarket, just like we do, right? Okay, we have the merchant, it's a trade boat. And I think you have to be an entrepreneur if you're going to come to Florida because you really have to make your way on, by yourself. So a Mr. Kittredge and a friend started a trade boat business, which was a, let's see, a, a sloop. I'm not a boat person, so a sloop is a one-mast um, boat that was converted to have shelves on the inside where they carry their wares and it would go up and down the Indian River. I think it went as far as um, Fort Pierce, maybe further as the boat was enlarged, and would stop at residences' homes for um, a 
I guess, deli home delivery of what you might need. So you would get your flour, your rice, probably some gardening tools, probably material. What you would probably find in a general store was on a boat. And the boat would announce its arrival by blowing a conch shell. And you would run it to the end of your dock and shop for what you wanted. If your neighbors knew that the boat was going to stop at your house, they might also say, can we shop at the same time that you shop? So they, that population of people, you had your boat, we have a car, the river was their um, driveway kind of thing. So we have history on boats. Schooners, steamboats, um, we de finally developed a little bit of um, Henry Flagler with his, the help needed for his family, helped um, bring us the Florida East Coast Railroad. Um, Florida East Coast Railroad, so you can't hear me, should I be talking louder? Oh, air conditioning, okay. Um, the Christiansons, Mr. Peter Christiansen was part of the railroad, so he came down and actually these are um, the Benson. This is Atlee Benson. These are the two Christiansen boys, and I haven't figured out who this gentleman would be, and I'm wondering if it's maybe um, a child of um, Lizzie Benson, but they're sitting on a railroad truck, wagon, cart, any railroad people? This would be the cart you would use to check out the railroads and you would pump it yourself. So we have the Christensen family and the Benson family here. It's called a wheel car. A wheel car? No, rail car. A rail, rail car. car. Okay. So well, there's the family on the rail car. <laughs> I guess one of the other developments was we had two entrepreneurs in Grant. One was visiting from Wisconsin, a Lorenzo um, Pons, and he had a friend, um, oh, can't think of the friend's name right now, Gail, Can anybody? Bottomley, okay, first, yeah, okay. Hollis. Hollis Bottomley, okay. Their idea was build a, a wooden platform, it accommodated an army tent, and they opened it as a rest stop. So I guess this would be our first Howard Johnson's <laughs> or um, a w Root Beer or, or something like that. So people traveling from um, the north, say coming from Titusville heading to Miami, would stop here and get your beverage and your hamburger. And I guess it was a pretty popular um, rest stop and the hamburgers were quite popular and I guess they were labeled a super burger. Hamburgers sold for five to ten cents in the 20s but they're sold for 15 and it was because it had an egg mixture and some additional top secret spices so I guess it's, I guess we could compare it to um, Kentucky Fried Chicken where the spices are kept a secret. So the boys ran the business for about a year. Um, they worked every other day or by arrangement. And after a while, maybe it became boring, I don't know, but poor Mr. Um, Pons' family came from Wisconsin and ran it after that. And they made it a permanent structure. And then we moved. Route 1 was developed between the railroad and the Indian River. So we took the business away from Old Dixie Highway, and so that little business kind of closed. Okay, the other uh, points of interest, I guess, Grant Grocery Store, built in 1894, went through um, several hands. Um, now it's Rib City. So Mr. Benson built it in 1894, and he operated it for a couple of years. It served as an early trading post, a post office, a telegraph office, an express office, a general store, an antique store, a grocery store, and now it's currently a restaurant. The owners are um, starting out with the Bensons in 1894. Lars Jorgensen bought it in 1896. The Jorgensen's um, 
ran the store after his dad has been here. Not sure what the date is on this photograph and this one, but there was a parade and people built floats. And in 1875, um, I guess they called the float green, 1875, and it's a, an Indian on it. And here's our welcome sign when you come into Grant. And I think um, this is probably coming from the west towards the Indian River. Anybody, does anybody, is anybody else from here? Or maybe that? Okay. Don't know any of the people in here, but you can definitely see what probably <coughs> might be the Grant grocery store over here and way in the background, the Indian mm -hmm. River. One of the things that we uh, did this past November was, because the Historica House celebrated 100 years, we did a special t-shirt thing, and we did a, a presentation for um, a big event that we had. And that was a year we celebrated the 50th anniversary of the Seafood Festival, and this was the original um, history section of our little event that we had on November 5th. So some of the stuff is from that particular event. We have a little bit of home cooking from Camp, uh, Campbell Soup recipe. Campbell Soup was developed in 1869. They hired a chemist, I think it was 1897, and he says, hey, if you take the water out of the soup, you can sell the can for 10 cents instead of 30 cents. So with that, Campbell soup advertised anywhere and everywhere. So we made some little tomato um, soup. It's supposed to be a cake. And that you can help yourself to with mints. Pineapples. Um, they don't grow well in New England, but you can use them as an inside plant. We went, Leslie and I took a tour to the homestead um, home in Vero Beach, and they were a plantation, a pineapple plantation at one time. The story is, oh, you just cut the top off, and you let it dry out, and you plant it in the ground, right? Well, what I learned was you can take your pineapple and spin your top off like this, and you have this little nubby thing. A glass of water. And if you peel, would you be my little person, Leslie? What you have to do is peel these furly leaves off until you find the roots. And then stick them in water. In a matter of a few weeks, you'll get a nice long root system, which you can then put right out in your garden. I think it saves the raw. and we'll pass that around. So I tried it. It works. <laughs> yeah. OK. I'm sure we put a little bit more on. I'm just going to pass this around. You can see the roots already showing through. They look like little nubs. I want to pass that around. Thanks. So with the pineapple industry, you have um, Boats that got there, well, I guess locally, you bought it locally. And then from there, if you wanted to send it to New York, you had to sail it upstream. And then from upstream, it probably got on a train and finally got to the, the place that, or its destination. So pineapples, what do we do with pineapples? There's a wonderful pineapple cream pie. I don't know if you've ever had any of that. It's really good. We dry the pineapple, and, or we sugar it, we put it in fruit. So it's a very versatile fruit. And let's see what else can we do? I'll tell you over here. Cooking. Okay. How did people manage to cook food? Because you didn't have a stove and you didn't have a refrigerator. You started a campfire and you kind of kept it going, I guess. We have uh, the opportunity to shop around for cookbooks on our travel, and we found one called the People's Home Recipe Book, published in 1920. So this will be a fun item to kind of look at. 
after. And we have, for the house, their money fundraisers is cookbooks. And I picked this particular book to bring today because it's more treasures of Grant because it has some of Clara's recipes in it. And I took out her, picked her folded picture. This is from this book right here. I'll give you a, a picture, a youthful picture of Clara. I'm going to take a guess. It was probably around the time of her engagement. So we have her recipes. And they're kind of strange because it says cook in a moderate oven. Well, what is a moderate oven? There weren't any degrees. Um, boiled cookies. Boiled cookies. She was famous for her chocolate chip cookies. Frying pan cookies. Here, I'm going. Okay. Um, in the house, if you go to visit, Clara used a what we call a flameless cooker, and it basically looks like a big ice chest. Has three pots in it. You know the camping pots that you use to cook on your open fire at your campsite. Well, it's an ice chest. It's insulated. It has three pots in it, and you have oops, a stone that you heat in the uh, in your fire carried in on a um, carrying device, pop it into your uh, opening for that particular pot that you choose, put your fruits and vegetables inside of that, put a cover on it, stick it into the opening and close the lid. So it's your first crock pot. And she went out to school and she cooked, she came home, dinner was ready. So you, you have this little pre-stove thing um, with three openings in it, so you could do your meats, your vegetables, and I imagine cakes, bread, or cookies kind of thing. So that's also at the house. And the house also has a collection of some of these items that I brought, in particular the pictures. Um, furniture that was either donated or, or given to the house. And it's set up to show you how they lived on the water as a family and, and survived. And survival for them was fishing business kind of thing. So did I miss anything? I think not. So what I'd like to have you do is walk around, help yourself to the little tomato <coughs> cupcake. Would you give us your schedule of opening because you closed the summer? Sure, we closed for the summer and we close this year. It, the last day that we're going to be open is May 25th. So that'll be the last Friday of the month. And right now we're going through some uh, cleaning process and setting up what would have been our boys' room to be an archive room. So we're busy collecting and um, our pictures are going to be rearranged so that we can tell a story. In the dining room they have the Postmasters. And it started out with Lewis Benson in 1898. He did it for a couple years. It then went to um, a Jorgensen, and the Jorgensen family ran the Grant Post Office from 1898 to 1956. So they were a dedicated family within the community. Mr. Jorgensen was also on the school committee or the school board. You can see that through the little teacher's remembrances cards. Um, the dock is available for your convenience. There's picnic tables around the area for summer events. Um, some people get married there. They don't use the house, but they get married on the dock um, and then have their celebration um, at the picnic <coughs> area. People who have died, some of the families have used our site for um, a reception. And because we closed for the summer doesn't mean you can't visit. Um, there's an outdoor bulletin board, and if, say, you had a Girl Scout group or you had a garden club that wanted to see the house, a small group, there's a telephone number available, um, and a person's contact name is um, Nancy um, Turner. So we'd like to have you come and see. Yes. Oh, excuse me. Um, how long does it take for that pineapple to grow? To, and to, uh, to make fruit? Oh, well, how long for the roots? Okay, the little roots you saw sticking out. Did you see this little yes. guy? Okay, so these little things are going to get a little bit longer. And I would say, once they're a half an inch long, you can put them in the ground. About how long? Month, month, two months maybe. Oh, okay. Two months. Okay. 
And then if you want to plant it in the ground, you can fertilize it with your uh, fruit fertilizer. But it takes about two years to make a, a pineapple plant. And I was so disappointed because I did all this work and I got a nice pineapple and something ate it. <laughs> and, and something's eating my peaches. No? Yes. Tom Cubbin, who is the, um, who's the county extension gardener, he's been here since 72. He says it's the squirrels that are coming. He says, yeah. Oh, well, we have squirrels a nice from the raccoon. like that. Raccoons. Raccoons. Yeah. And the funny thing about it is that there are a lot of people that do not know that pineapples were grown here as a crop. Yes. But he was talking about pineapple shortcake over at the Flower <laughs> Garden Festival. And he said, about the time you get your pineapples, just the next day is when you're going to pick it. That night. Something comes in. <laughs> well, I can't figure out what would school. Go ahead. I just wanted to re uh, uh, deviate from the pineapple for a minute. Uh, it does take about two years. I yes. have grown them, and they're so fun to grow. Uh, low maintenance. But would you explain the tomato soup thing again? Oh, the 30 cents again. I'm oh yeah. That. Okay. I used to eat tomato yeah. soup like that. We had tomato soup every Friday afternoon uh, for dinner with grilled cheese. Yep. God, I used to hate it. Okay. <laughs> Campbell's soup people. Campbell's, Mr. Campbell's and another gentleman started a business, 1869, and it was to do condiments, canned fruit, canned vegetables. And um, they hired a chemist, and the chemist said, you could reduce the cost of your product if you took the water out. So you have condensed tomato soup, condensed chicken soup, condensed. So that, that made it very affordable to families. You open up a can of soup. Where were the chemists? Were the chemists in Grant? Is that right? No, no, the Campbell Soup Company. Oh, what does it have to do with Grant? Uh, they could buy Campbell's soup in a condensed form off your trade boat or probably at the green grocery store and for 10 cents a can feed your family versus the whole soup already made for 30 cents. I got you. Thank you. Oh, okay. I didn't mean to apply that um, the chemist lived in Grant. We just bought the food product. Yeah. Um, is it, it's in the County Park. The, it, the Fisherman's Landing, landing, is, landing is part it's of... It's a really lovely place to go, even if the house is closed in summer, yep. mm -hmm. to have a picnic lunch there. It's a beautiful and I, spot. It yeah. Is. Um, the, the reason it's closed is a lot of snowbirds come and we have more business in the winter months because it's an enjoyable event to take. And I was looking at um, statistics that I we had in our sign-in guest book. Last year, we had... 39 people show up in May, and then the year before we had five. So the question for us as an organization is, do we want to um, have the house open during the extremely hot summer season? And the answer is no, kind of thing. So, yes? Last year I wanted to go to the Grant uh, Seafood Festival. I've not ever been there before. I've heard such wonderful things about it. But they, scared me off because of the parking. Have you thought about how you can rearrange the parking so it's easier for people to get there? Yes, a couple things. Last year, they did busing from the Valkyria Airport, and that was the year we had 50,000 people on a Saturday. So I understand your parking dilemma. Um, if you come early in the morning, I think it's 10 to 6, um, you have a better chance at parking because what you're doing is you're driving up First Street and parking in all the fields beyond that. Now, this year the police closed off First Street, so it's easier to get there early or get there later in the afternoon because the people that have arrived at six, seven, eight, nine o'clock are all tired out and walked through all the different um, concession stands and crafters. So you find easier parking. But last year, I saw these big long lines of people going from one side of the 
park to the other and I went, what is, what is that? And it was, they were getting on their bus to go back to the Valkyria Airport. Sure. When was the Sini Lumber Company started? Oh, good question. Probably in the 30s. 1930s, the Macalonis are, are Ron, Ron said. Well, no, I was referring to you. No, oh, Sandy has been here all my life. Sandy's so been here all your life. Yes. You have a picture of there of a, the dock off First Street. Oh, um, off of First Street. Well, let's see. I wanted to tell you about it. Oh, okay. My little dock, right? Okay, we're in Florida. I didn't know, the question was, was it the Benson Dock? Was it a town dock? No, it was, it was a town dock, and it was on First Street. The building on the left side of the picture was, um, in conjunction with the fishing industry, was where they uh, processed crabs. Oh. And I had an aunt that picked crabs there. Yep. And Clive Kitchell had that uh, at the end of the dock. Okay, right there at, at the end of First Street. So this was the First Street dock. I think most people were in the fishing industry. There, uh, yeah, there too. Came back. I think it's closer to the land, right? Yeah, yeah, on the north side of the dock. Yeah, on this side, if you look at the picture. All the buildings were on the north side. Right. All the buildings were on the north side. Right. The homes no, were. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. The crab well, house was on the south side. Yeah. Okay. Where they picked the crabs. My mother used to pick the crabs there years ago. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And, and then the, the barber shop was there. And it was still, the, uh, let's see, I was born in 39. The barber left back about the time I was born. And the chair, the, there was a two chair barber shop. Name was Denny. That's it. And, uh, and Earlene and Marie Goodwin came up to the beach during the summer. We go out there and use the, the barber chairs and swing around and play it. <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. Okay. This is a newspaper, um, the Sunday Times, September 18, 1960. And it happens to capture the 1959 post office. Oh. Uh, it captures um, couch manufacturing, big um, company that did dredging pumps and stuff like that. Um, we have a picture of Alfred Holgerson, who was married to a Jorgensen um, woman, and Laura Jorgensen, and I think that is their two-story family estate that is probably still standing, and it's on um, Old Dixie Highway. Pardon me? I call it, we grew up, we call it on the hill. The north of the hill? No, on, the hill. On, the hill. Oh, on the hill. Okay. Um, oh, where the golf course is? Was. Was. Okay. Um, this is a picture of the uh, Jorgensen fish house. And you can see some of the nets drying in the background area because if you made the net, the fish would get caught in the net and you'd have to repair holes. And Robert Humes, whose mother is a Benson, um, Florence Shook Humes, was Lily, uh, Jorgen, Lily and Ada Benson's um, daughter. Nine kids, again, big family kind of thing. What's what we got here? Oh, the community center building. All right, so after the one room schoolhouse, we went to brick and mortar. So that is our community center. And it's now currently library, home of the seafood festival, was a um, fire station once upon a time too. What else have we got in here? Don Haywood, um, crab, house. crab house, right? And again, we got the um, grand grocery. I should have the pocket on the back of the shirt. Um, let's see, the grand grocery store, and that's when it was antiques. So, I mean, can you imagine coming from Europe to America, North America, deciding you didn't like where you lived, picking up again for making another major move, moving to Florida, and then becoming very successful. And I wonder if the Europeans had more money because they built a grocery store in 1894. The Jorgensen built the Ridgeland Hotel. You know, I just couldn't imagine where the money comes from once they had it stashed in the mattress. Go ahead. I was going to tell you. Uh, 
in order to get your mail to the train, they had canvas bags. Yes. And they had them on a pole next to the railroad track, and the conductor would reach out his arm and grab the bag and bring it in, and that's how you would send your mail. My grandfather had his own little canvas bag, and it says R.T. Smith, and I still have the bag. So oh. Wow. Now, there, there is a post office museum in north of us, Volusia County. Does uh, that make sense? In, I think there's one in Titusville. Titusville? Okay, this one I said, Mom, when we drive home, Leslie, this summer, we have to go to the mail post office museum kind of thing. Okay, so it's almost 4 o'clock. Run up and have a little tomato soup uh, <laughs> cupcake. And that appeared in the um, Campbell's Soup History Cookbook. Um. It's our meeting. Come on up and enjoy yeah. all the different materials.